Hello, Malcolm here, and welcome to Tuesday Teaching Tips. This is episode 256, and a second bite of the cherry, because this week we are talking again about the connection between the spirit and singing and unity. Even though there's not a lot of teaching in the New Testament about singing, the teaching we have is supremely significant. So last week we talked about Ephesians chapter 5, and today we're going to be talking about that other major passage about singing, Colossians chapter 3. In verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. See that word peace there twice? And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through, and here he mentions the music, psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God, with gratitude in your hearts. Thankfulness is a big theme here. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I'm going to offer some thoughts today on this topic, but also again to say, as last week, that part of the, par part of the purpose of doing this is to see what we can get that's materially significant and helpful to us when we're looking at a small passage of scripture about a topic that doesn't have much teaching. And how do we deal with that as people who preach and teach? And we come across something like this, which is not a, a thread with a great deal of teaching in the whole of the New Testament. And yet, if we're not careful, could be taken out of the context of the rest of the epistle or could be neglected because it can look like a throwaway comment, as someone once said about this. But I don't think Paul was in the habit of just giving throwaway comments. Everything seemed significant. When you were it's not like today we, we type into a computer and we can easily delete or copy and paste. In those days, it took a lot more effort to write things down and preserve them. So when Paul writes this, it's important to the spiritual health of that congregation. And I believe it's spiritually significant to us today, if we can better at least understand it. So what's going on here in Colossae? Well, we don't have time to deal, in, deal with the whole book. But what we do know is that the church in Colossae was made up of, of, of house churches, perhaps 30 to 50 people. One of them was, of course, Philemon. In chapter 1, verse 2 of Philemon, it mentions that. And in this part of Asia Minor, there were many gods, so-called gods, worshipped. And the Apostle Paul in this context is concerned about syncretism. In other words, the context in this context, the blending together of Christian and pagan worship. That seems to be a lot of his, uh, his issue. And that's why he centers the letter very much on the sufficiency of Christ and the unique, unique nature of Christ, that he's not like any other so-called gods. And you would benefit from uh, uh, even just a skim read of the book of Colossians to put the, what we're looking at here today in, in context. Now, is he writing here about individual singing or congregational singing? I think we must say it's congregational singing, probably as well as individual, but in the context, congregational singing. All of his instructions here are to the congregation. In verse 12, as God's chosen people uh, bear with each other, forgive one another, and so on. This is all one another language. And I think this fits in uh, with that as well. Now, let's deal with the actual verse. He says he wants the message of Christ to dwell among them richly. So the question is, what is this message of Christ? I would say it's more than just the truth about Christ. More than just facts about Christ. He's not just talking about preaching here. And I've often taught this as that we need to have the message of Christ preached and dwell among us richly and I, there's some truth in that but I think what he's talking about here is more an atmosphere it's a message that centers on Christ it's a good reminder for us preachers and teachers that our preaching and teaching must be primarily Christological not pragmatic but he's talking about here a fellowship that derives its purpose and its strength from Jesus our congregational strength is not from our gifts and our attributes it's it's from Christ that's how this message of Christ can dwell among them richly as it inspires them to become the people that God has called them uh, to be. The scriptures help the community to center themselves on Christ as a community. And for this message to dwell richly, what a great word, means that it is in their midst. Another way of translating it. Let, let this be in your midst. Let it be your substance. Let it be your atmosphere as a congregation. Let Christ be who he is in you and with you every time you meet. 
In other words, this message of Christ is not something to be uh, dissected, uh, grasped, conceptualized. It's not just to be taught or simply to be understood. It's a dynamic experience. When they come together, they bring Christ with them and the Spirit of Christ in them together to form the congregation, to worship together. Then there's something richer that happens when they're together. And I think that's what he's getting on uh, about here. If you want to look at the word richly in 1 Timothy 6, 17, Titus 3, 6, and 2 Peter 1, 11, I'll put the references in the show notes. You may benefit from that. So Paul is urging them to let Christ be centered among them so that he makes a difference to the way they live. And that's what he's been talking about in the previous few verses from verse 12 to 15 about being holy, dearly loved, clothing themselves with compassion and kindness, Humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with each other, forgiving each other. Uh, forgive as the Lord forgave you and put on all, all over all this uh, the, the love which binds everything together in perfect unity. He's talking about their body life. This is what he's hoping for them. This is what he's developing in them. Is this ability to let Christ dwell in them, among them, in, in a rich and deep way. So the command is to, the command is to dwell richly in Christ. So then the question is, how does the singing fit into this? And I would suggest it's not so much that we dwell richly in this message and with this message by teaching, admonishing, and singing to and with one another. It's that we decide to dwell with Christ as central. That's our conviction. And then we sing as a result in a way that expresses that. In the NIV, it says... Uh, let that message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another. But that's that's one particular uh, option of translating that. But it may not be the best way to translate it. A more accurate reading, I think, from the reading I've done, is to see the singing as the uh, as the channel through which the centralizing of Christ could be expressed. It's, so because you've made this decision that Christ is central to you as a congregation, Therefore, sing in such a way as to express it and teach one another to inhabit it all the more or be strengthened in it. The NASB, for example, translates this. Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you, comma, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So it sees it that way. And I think that may be more helpful for us because... Although singing about God is going to strengthen us in the centrality of Christ, it's more that they have a decision that they have made that then means that when they sing, that they end up strengthening one another because this is a, a conviction they already have. Now, what about the Psalms, the hymns, and the spiritual songs? Um, certainly how to instruct with a hymn is not clear, and Paul doesn't lay this out. It does fit, perhaps, with what we see in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 26, uh, where Paul says to the Corinthians, uh, correcting their behavior, of course, when you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edu edification. He's not saying don't bring your own hymn or psalm. Don't bring your own teaching. Don't bring your own revelation. He's not saying that. He's saying bring it, but use it wisely and for the benefit of everybody instead of your own ego. So it seems as if people in the church in Corinth, and perhaps this was the same elsewhere, had a hymn they liked, perhaps had a hymn they'd written, perhaps with their own little house church, they'd written a hymn and thought, let's bring it together when we meet with the other house churches, or something like that. But they bring a psalm, uh, they bring a hymn. So I think what we see here is that if Paul is emphasizing teaching by singing, it means that he thought it was important and observed that it had been neglected or not done in a healthy way in Colossae, but he had a vision for it to be done well. So he talks about Psalms in the New Testament. We see a few references, which I'll put in the show notes. It looks like Paul was talking about Psalms, um, not in the technical sense of the Psalms of the Old Testament, but more in a general sense. We read from early uh, uh, Jewish writers around that period, like Philo and Josephus, that when they wrote about Psalms, they were talking about them as a, in a category of religious song rather than the book of Psalms from the Old Testament. The word hymn is found as a noun, a thing, uh, only in this passage and the parallel, you could say, passage in Ephesians 5. 
It's used as a verb in Matthew 26, verse 30, which is where Jesus and his disciples sang a hymn. In fact, in the Greek, it's they hymned. Uh, they went hymning, if you like. So Jesus and his disciples were hymning. And we see that uh, same word a few other places in Mark 14, Acts 16, and Hebrews uh, chapter 2. What about songs he talks about here? Uh, songs from the Spirit, or spiritual songs, as another translation puts it. Uh, this word song always appears with the qualifier spiritual. We see that in Revelation 5, 9, 14, 3, and 15, 3. Again, I'll put those references in the show notes. What were these spiritual songs? Most likely, I would suggest they were songs written by the congregation, made up themselves. Perhaps they were even made up on the spot during a church service. So I don't think that psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs are meant to be discrete categories. I'd say they, they tend to bleed into one another. They may express emphases, uh, but more likely they are meant to be just a, a, a way for Paul of expressing all the different ways you sing, uh, do it in the right way. Do it in a way that builds up peace and unity. Do it in a way that expresses the centrality of Christ to you. Do it in a way that's wit that wi is wise. Do it in a way that admonishes one another and that teaches one another. And do it always with gratitude in your hearts. This word gratitude is important, is important and interesting because it's normally translated grace. Do it with the grace in your hearts. In other words, the phrase could be, in the grace of God or by the grace of God, sing by the grace. In other words, because again, because you have this centrality of Christ and now because you reflect on the grace of God, sing this way. It would be reminding the Colossians of the grace in which they stood and that's what would inspire their singing to come, as he says, from the heart. Make sure it's in the heart. So a few thoughts in summary and then um, you can tell me what you think. I'd like to know. So first of all, I think from this passage and from Ephesians, we see that there are, if you like, vertical and horizontal directions of singing. Singing is for one another and it is for God. It's both and it's never either one or the other, really. Secondly, teaching the faith to one another can and must be done through music. We're going to try an experiment, by the way, a week uh, Sunday in the Watford Church, where I'm going to ask the congregation, I've already mentioned this to them, that to help me with something as as in what we're going to do is I'm going to preach the sermon and then I'm going to ask them what songs will help to reinforce the message of this scripture we've looked at today. What songs can you think of? And they'll come up with some ideas and then we'll sing at least one or two, maybe even three of those songs. It'll be a challenge for me and the other musicians to see if we can accompany those songs. If not, we'll sing them without instruments. There's no problem with that. But that's how we're going to approach it. We're going to look for songs that can reinforce the message the truth, and what we have conviction about, about Christ being central. Thirdly, church music should be, I believe, primarily verbal. Uh, the music's beautiful, tunes are great and all that, but the verbal part is important because the message is more important than the media. If we're going to be teaching with wisdom, that's the case. Fourthly, a Christological focus. In other words, a focus on Christ in our singing. How much of Jesus is in view in the songs we sing. Have a look at last Sunday. How many songs really were about Jesus? They don't all have to be all about Jesus in every line of every verse, but are they primarily Christological? It does seem to be that's the focus here. Fifthly, active participation. Worship is something we do, not something done to us. They did it. It wasn't just that the worship leaders were leading uh, or the musicians were musicianing. They were called to sing to and admonish one another, teach one another in a song. It's active participation. It's not here about the musicianship, the perfection of it. It's not about whether we all sing in tune. It's not about whether we all like the songs necessarily. It's not about our performance. It's about us helping one another in the way that God intends. Sixthly, I believe a rich variety of songs is healthy. We need a variety of the old, the new, and especially, I would say, the local, ones that mean something to us and are made up by us. Remember, a song doesn't have to be five verses long. It doesn't have to be complex musically. You could just sing a chorus, a four-line chorus that you, you've made up, your congregation has made up. I think it means uh, a lot when we do that. Seventhly, sincerity and devotion. We worship because of who uh, we are in Christ. We worship because of who God is. And we worship because of 
well, what's in my heart and your heart as a result. It comes from a sincere place of, of Christological focus, of him being central, and of devotion to God. And finally, eighthly, uh, we sing because we understand God's grace. As much as we teach about music, and we should, and teach about singing, and we should, we mustn't neglect the teaching about the grace of God, because that's what inspires all of this, singing to God with gratitude uh, in your hearts. Whatever you do, and I think that the whatever you do here is referring to all the ins other instructions he's given in Colossians before this. Whatever you do there or whatever you do in your services regarding singing, in word or deed, do it all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So what are your thoughts about this? Some suggestions. Firstly, why not have a read of the whole book of Colossians and reflect on why you think Paul thought that, believed that, knew that, singing was so important for the church. Secondly, what do you think it means for you to teach and admonish in song? You say, well, that's for the song leader. No, it's for the worship leader. No, it's for the musicians. No, not what Paul says. What does it mean for you to teach and admonish in song? Thirdly, how can you center your life on Christ in such a way that it inspires you to sing about God's grace? What would that look like? Please drop me a line and leave a comment wherever you hear or see this recording. We learn best when we learn in community. If you want to email me, it's malcolm at malcolmcox.org. And you can also have a look on my website for other um, topics connected with this and, and my YouTube channel as well. Well, that's it for now for singing. We'll see what comes next. Uh, it depends on some of the comments I get back and we'll see. I might record some more. But until the next time, I hope you have a terrific Tuesday and a wonderful week. Take care. God bless.